Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the idea behind the political spiral is, as I say every day, it's not a shot where you buy election memorabilia, it's somebody from the left. Today we welcome a man who failed uh, to sell any more records, so he's given up singing. Andy Williams, political commentator, how are you? Very well, thank you. And of course, the erstwhile, the man who should have starred in Yes Prime Minister, Benedict Spence, <laughs> Conservative <laughs> commentator, how are you? What a, oh, what a dreadful week it's been. Yeah, I, could be, I could be better, yeah. and frankly. And I'd yes. also like to say <laughs> that after the football last night, um, apparently both of you were drunk, steaming drunk, and you both hung over. I didn't have one drink. Uh, Benedict Spence, how do you plead? Uh, <laughs> there's no point in it. I've already You're given it away. Awful, going, man. Oh, God. Yeah. I had a great time at Did the you? time. Um, it was, it was, it's not been so bad today, but uh, it's been a long day, is all yeah, I can say, and it's going to be a long sort of build up to the final itself. Are we going to win? <laughs> here's, a st here's a stat for you. Oh. Spanish teams since 2001 have played in 22 major European finals at national and club level. How many have they lost? All of them bar three. They've won every single one. Yes. Uh, we've also, we've also <laughs> yeah. beaten... I've read, have you heard this stat about the teams that begin with S, although the Netherlands didn't? No. Our most successful games have been Slovakia, Serbia... Anyway, I don't know. And you were drunk as well, didn't you? No, I had a few beers, and I think, as one should during a football... It was um, great, wasn't it? It was, oh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. What a finish. Now, I think, I think we've got really... Look, we're not favourite. Spain, the best team in the tournament. They've been... They've but been, tournament football, but, as Jason Cundy just said yeah. to me, Jason and I shared only two testicles between us that's another story this is absolutely true he said he said to me just now as i was walking and he's right tournament football is very very different one yep. moment can make a difference the goal without ollie watson and of course you're right this country's on its backside everybody's miserable mm. benedict's hung over yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> water bills are going yeah. up the tories are in meltdown. but actually it is something but i've just got this sneaking feeling that we are going to win dirty I we, are, so. we are we are we've been playing i don't care what anybody says we've been, apart from the first 45 minutes yesterday we've been rubbish mm. somehow we're in the final. Now, you can talk about lucky runs and all that. Greece were rubbish when they won it. Portugal were even worse when they won it. That's what I'm holding on to. We've got three or four absolutely world-class players yep. who could do anything. And that's what... You know, Be Bellingham has not been brilliant during this tournament, no. but one bicycle kick, and that won us that game. Very true. Foden, mm. you know, Kane's not had a good tournament, but he could turn it on. So I think there's... I'm, I, I believe... Good for you. I it's coming. My, my <laughs> wife's been out. She's a rugby fan. Men with different shaped balls. She, mm. genuinely factual. She's bought bunting. She's bought flags. She's bought football shirts. We're going foot. Are you doing that on Sunday? What are you doing? I have no. I can't actually remember what I'm doing. I'm probably Except just again getting, getting, getting drunk. That's probably what I'll <laughs> be doing. I'll be leaving the bunting to somebody else. But I will say, yes. Yesterday, if anybody wants to listen back to Julia Hartley Brewer's show, I did predict that the score would be two-one and that the winning goal would be in the last minute of the game. So, so did well, Isabel Oakshot at twenty minutes to oh, seven. Really? On, on, oh, on okay. drive yesterday, <laughs> I don't know anything about football. I think we're going to. Was she listening to the show earlier? Perhaps? No, she's never heard of you. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, talking about football, let's, let's talk about the first thing. Uh, your leader, Sir Dreary, he says there should be a bank holiday, and I find myself actually for once at complete odds with my viewers and listeners because I don't think there should be a bank holiday. I think we've got enough time off. I think we need to get our country back on its feet. I don't think it's necessary at all. And a really, really salient, salient point. Listen to this, um, Brian in Margate. Why bank holiday for the boys? We never had one for the women. When they won, it would be totally unfair. Mm. I yeah, bet well. Dreary Starmer's considering that as an option. What do you make? Should there be? Shouldn't there be? I think it'd be lovely if there oh. was bank holiday. And I'll tell you why. Because the Partly this because, Labour stuff, this. Well, mm. Firstly, because there hasn't been a, a, an England men's team win a tournament since, for 58 years. So it is a massive, massive, massive achievement. And you know what? Some things are more important than GDP actually having one day a monday hopefully it? it's sunny mm. and lifts socialist, everyone's lifts everyone's spirit social more, social more important things than gdp everybody else who's feeling very poor going no there isn't no, but that's exactly it. GDP my, doesn't help people who are feeling poor. Benedict is, can't even speak to anybody. He's just looking straight at him, not even looking at let's him. Just, let's just get through the next 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it will be fantastic. Um, I don't think there should be a bank holiday because it's not the World Cup. Actually, I don't think it's as important as the World Cup. I think that the European Championships is something... It's not as old as the World Cup. It was uh, invented in 1960 as a sort of a secondary tournament. We're expanding it every year because actually it needs to generate more money, more interest. And let's and be clear, half the teams are not very good. And it doesn't change, by the way. Um, the wonderful output here at Talk. It didn't change when the pandemic was on. It didn't change mm. when we all went through divorces, not just Mike and me, others as well. And, and we're still here, and that's the way it is. So, you know, I think whatever, do what you want. Uh, right, OK. Now, the other... The, 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 we talked uh, uh, to that lady um, who worked for a water company. Mm. Before that, we talked to a, a guy who said this is absolutely a result of privatisation. And actually, I have to say this to you, Benedict. I, mm. I, I'm not a... Um, uh, privatisation has worked in many instances. 
But when you look at a service that is basically saying to people who are struggling, mm -hmm. and actually, even if you're not saying, a 21% hike in bills across England and Wales will not, according to their own PR, deal with the millions lost through leaks. I'm not an environmentalist. What they're doing to our rivers and our seas is utterly disgusting. I guess just because I've moved to the sea, I've seen it. It's vile, right? I get that. It's not right. And then you look at all of that, you look at it, and then you see these fat cat losses getting millions. Mm. There is nobody in this country that thinks that that's acceptable. No. You would understand that. No, and I agree with it. You shouldn't be able to privatise natural monopolies, of which the water is one. The caller was right. You are stuck with the water that you get. You can't, in fact, build a viaduct from another part of the country to get water from somewhere else if you don't like that one. We're very bad at handling this. Very few, uh, if any, major countries that I can think of have the same system as ours of privatising water. And those that do, let's look at the United States, have instant is where people are being poisoned in some cases yep. by their water supply. It's not a good thing. It's also not great that actually the majority of shareholders in British water are not British citizens or British taxpayers. It goes overseas to other countries, uh, you know, be they German individuals or the sovereign wealth fund or, of various Gulf states. That's not right. And it must be said it's the same for the railways as well. If it's a natural monopoly, you shouldn't be privatising it. But I don't think it's simply a result of privatisation. I think because, you know, you can look at the NHS. The NHS isn't privatised, but it is not working very well. And you have some similar problems in that it is massively bloviating, it's oversized, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There is a culture in this country of trying to get as many jobs for as many people as possible, even to the detriment of growth or efficiency. Very and true. that is a real problem. You see this in the civil service. You also see it in major privatised companies. Once they reach a certain stage, actually it becomes in their self-interest to expand their remit, expand their size, not necessarily to improve on the efficiency or the output. That is a cultural issue that we have across the board until you actually address it. And it's not just UK, I'd say it's a Europe-wide issue as well because this is affecting many European countries as well. But you don't get it in the United States. You don't get it in certain other countries as well. It's about the culture of doing work. It's about the culture of your government. If you see your role not as creating wealth, not as creating uh, efficiency, but as creating jobs so that everybody feels like they've got something to do, mm -hmm. that's what you get. You get I mean, a that, stunted that, economy. I mean, for a man who's hung over, that, that actually is... Imagine if I was... Imagine if you were on four. That's, a, that's an, <laughs> an, a, an, an outstandingly accurate analogy, isn't it? Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I mean, it's corporate failure on a massive yeah. scale. I agree. It's not, it's not the fact that these uh, utilities were privatised that's the problem in itself. It's the fact that they've been run so badly mm -hmm. and with, by such greedy people and is it I mean, easy even... to blame privatization for uh, you can understand mm. the as a, as a saying, that, that, that's caused those greedy yeah. individuals to run yeah. the water companies that are screwing us all into the ground no i mean when thames water was privatized it had a balanced balance sheet it's now in 50 bit 15 one five billion pounds your man top top matthew Topham from the, the campaign has said that they will be bust within 10 months I mean, they, it yeah, looks like right. it looks like they will. I mean, Jake, Jacob Rees Mogg, right? Jacob Rees Mogg said, ex Tory MP, uh, ex Tory MP, yeah, very unfortunate. He said earlier this year, if Thames, he said Thames Water should be allowed to go bankrupt. The shareholders would lose their equity, but they took too much cash out, so they deserve to lose their equity. And I think that's absolutely right. If it wasn't a water company, I'd say so. But if we're talking about the supply and what actually might end up being, you know, affecting millions of people, Thames Water, it's one of those situations where I do think probably the government will end up stepping in before it gets to that stage. Mm. Whether or not we think that it should be allowed to go back, again, if it was a company that was supplying, I don't know, vacuum cleaner parts, yes, absolutely. No, I think that's right. Yeah. But Obviously because it is be a natural monopoly of quite literally <clears throat> the most important resource yeah. that every every industry needs, it's one of those where I suspect, that to our detriment, the taxpayers' detriment, probably the government will step in and have to do something. And I hope then that they learn the lesson, that the Labour government learn the lesson, but also the Conservatives, if somehow they ever get back into power, they learn actually there are some things that you should not be siphoning off to other people to make a quick buck in the short term. It doesn't matter what your country's balance sheet says, it doesn't matter what your favourite economist says. Actually, in practice, at, it, when it comes down to matters of national security as much as anything else, some things need to be in the hands of the state. Water is one of them. And the other thing is, once you've made that quick buck, you can't do it again. No. Once you've sold it, that's it. So it's mm. just sh it was short-termism. It's very interesting. By the way, uh, we're going to go to a break, but I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about the big news story of the day. I'm sure you both have heard this. Tensions have surfaced in reform today. Uh, Nigel Farage has effectively sacked his deputy, Ben Habib. Uh, Richard Tice was just on. He's the new deputy leader, the Grant Shapps of reform. In seven days, he's been the chairman, the leader, and now the deputy leader. <laughs> he said, and I quote, look, you know, uh, this is about a parliamentary party, five MPs. Ben Habib, and I'm just going to repeat this as we go to a break, because loads of people are getting wound up. I've just been informed by Nigel Farage that Richard Tice is taking over as deputy leader of the party. 
Consequently, I no longer hold that position. He tweeted this earlier. I am considering my position more generally in light of this change. I have long held concerns about the control of the party and the decision-making processes. I will reflect on all of this. And then he finishes by saying the key to me is that Reform UK stays true to the promises made to the British people. The movement we have created does not belong to us. It belongs to the people we are obliged and in debt. Just another news story today on the back of that horrendous story about the racing commentator John Hunt's family his wife and two daughters being slain by that crossbow man. I don't even want to bring it. I can't, we've just been talking about that. Um, there's a, another story quickly which says an awful lot about this country. A manhunt has been launched after two suitcases containing human remains were found at the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. Officers were called to the bridge late last night after a man was acting suspiciously. When police arrived ten minutes later, the man had fled, leaving the two suitcases at the scene, for God's sake. CCTV footage of the suspect is released. He's a black man with a beard. They have no more details. He's got a baseball cap on if you are watching, that's on screen right now. Uh, detectives not aware of any current risk to the wider public, but anyone who sees him asked to call, obviously, the emergency number 999. If you are watching on YouTube or on screen, it's there. But, my God. Guys, um, when we start talking about stuff and we get agitated, when we think about that crossbow attack and then we think of that, what, what's the world coming to, Ben? I mean, it's obviously this has nothing to do with him and it's in some ways rather unfortunate that it's happened, but it's interesting and rather prescient that this has come in the days after Sir Keir Starmer laid out his plan for prison reform, which was, we have too many people in prison. And I think increasingly, actually, when you hear these sorts of stories coming out, I think a lot of members of the public will go, I don't remember you campaigning on that, and frankly, we disagree. There no, are I'm not going to stick up for Sir Keir Starmer, but I have heard from many people that one of the reasons that Rishi Sunak mm. called the election was because he was fully aware that the prisons were about to overthink. And I do not, and I will no. say this, this mm. is not anti-Tory or anti-Labour thing. Mm. I have no understanding, like I have no understanding why our politicians of this mm. generation cannot sort out the, 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 the immigration problem, why somebody doesn't grab the bull by the horns and mm. build more bloody prisons. Well, I don't understand it. That's because it's a planning issue. Well, that's ludicrous, Benedict. It I, is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. It is ludicrous, but, but that's true. the situation we found ourselves in. And the reality is that we are literally in three weeks time going to run out of space in prisons so there has to be a decision taken that decision was ducked by Rishi Sunak yep. against the advice of his I gave the example. I, I, listen I completely agree Alex Chalk, we know, but I, give the, I gave the example I apologize for repeating these guys weren't here my father-in-law 80 buys his first car a year ago new car new car I mean it worked all his life I mean grafted right mm. has it nicked his insurance has gone from 600 quid to two and a half thousand pounds mm. Right? That's not his fault. So he listens to Sir Keir Starmer saying petty criminals are going to be released and he's ranting his head off when I get back the other night, and understandably. Yeah, but I mean, in the short term, so there has to be a pra there has to be a practical solution, and you have to. I think you have to distinguish between violent offenders and sexual offenders, for whom it's absolutely cast iron. Those are not people we should even be considering releasing, and other people. I'm afraid that's just the reality of where we are. Should we build more prisons? Absolutely, it's mad that we're hundreds of people away from. But even that the other day with Reeves, that's a, mm. that's. A, I mean, that, that language is great, three hundred thousand, but she absolutely knows mm. that those three hundred thousand houses will only be built and passed by local councils, half of mm. which are Tory yeah. and half of which are Labour of the Liberty. This, this is going to be a serious issue that Labour faces because a lot of its new seats are marginal seats because they don't mm. necessarily have huge majorities. And it's mm. the same problem that the Tories face, is that actually MPs will go, I quite like being an MP, I don't want to lose my seat in five years' time, so I will actually look to work around this where possible. Do you not know the Housing Minister, Matthew Pennicott? Mm -hmm. Have you not heard mm -hmm. about him? He, he, he was yeah. front and centre at saying, I don't want 1,500 houses built in my constituency because it upsets certain people that vote going to require a sort of element of Stalinism, if you like, from Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. He's actually ha going to have to be very ruthless with Stalinism. people. Stalinism. Yeah, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, again, this, but I go back to what we were saying about Keir Starmer saying there are too many people in prison. He could have very easily and justifiably stood there and gone, under the Tories, under 14 years of Conservative rule, 17 prisons were closed in this country, including the second best one in terms of reoffending rates. Closed for no readily good reason other than to save money in the short term. The Ministry of Justice had 40% of its budget slashed because the Tories thought it was an easy sell to say no money for prisoners or lawyers and everybody would be on board with it. And courts were and closed they, as well. Yep, there are now three-year backlogs in some cases for criminal cases. This is the Tories' fault. But he hasn't. He's turned this into a humanitarian, ideological... There are too many people in prison. He's, in prison sorry. He's trying to spin it as a sort of a different way of doing things. And I think it is going to 
it is going to come back to bite him because I just don't think with the levels of crime that we have, and we often hear, oh, well, violent crime's down in this country. It's not. People just aren't reporting it on the same level. You know, petty crime, we often hear, is up. But what is petty crime if not violent? A mugging is violent. Somebody well, smashing your window your, is yeah, violent. What about victims of your shop being nicked to my, and my, as you my said, father-in-law's And as you say, like, your father, many other people like your father, might not bother to report these things. because dead. Well, of course, but that's, he's not driving, obviously. Well, I mean, it, well, it might dead. explain why he's not reporting things to the police. But, Absolutely. You know, uh, he's dead. <laughs> quite right, too. He's actually more alive than you, the way you feel. <laughs> but the I thing, agree with you. Yeah, but this is the thing. If you yeah. decide, straight off the bat, not to go, we are going to be tough on crime, the Tories won't, but to go, do you know what? Prison isn't the answer for everybody. And then you have the succession of yep. serious, violent crime. You have the massive increase in people coming across the channel. But you have the story about Rotherham rapists being released early. And there is all of this on top of that. How is that going to play? People are not going to give you a lot of time. But to we have to distinguish, change. as I said, we have to distinguish between violent and sexual crime, which we should not touch in terms of how that's dealt with, and other crimes. And it might not might not seem possible. Are we forgetting now, the impact of even trivial crimes on the victim? That's what I no, want. No, absolutely, absolutely not. Trivial crimes are not trivial crimes to the victim. They. They're, they're a pain in the backside in, in, at a low level and can be really traumatic at a high level. But you have to look at the evidence, and the evidence says, if you look at, I heard this today, if you look at crimes for which a sentence is less than 12 months, right? Yep. For less than 12 months, people who go to prison, 55% reoffending rate. People who don't go to prison, who either have their sentences suspended, do community service, 22% reoffending rate. Interesting. But that, but that actually doesn't focus down on the nature of the crime itself. If it's somebody who, I don't know, has committed sort of minor fraud or something like that, the odds are that they're not going to recommit it. Or if it's something that's been done by accident, something like reckless driving rather than dangerous driving, that's a different kind of thing, but they would fall under the same category. So you can't necessarily put all of those well, things together. I, but here is, in fact, some, of the, some more of key stats, if you want. The majority of prisoners in prison in the UK are for violent or sex offences. That's not low-level crime. The majority, over 50%, are there for violent or sexual crimes. So if we're talking about a third straight off the bat, you're getting dangerously close towards that territory of, well, is this a minor crime or is that... The I, kind think, of I think we And here's all... another thing. 20% of the murders in this country are committed by people out on remand from prison. So they are being released, these dangerous people. They are already I out think there. what Keir Starmer's saying is it, it's, it's both of these things can be true, right? There is a problem whereby we've run out of space, we need to build more prisons, we should do that. But there's also an opportunity to reform form for certain crimes, for certain sentences, how we do that. And I don't think we should look, we cannot look at the current system and go, actually, it's perfect. All we need to do is create more space. I mean, uh, right, let, yeah, OK, I, listen, mm. like, you used the word reform. I have to move on to this before we let you go. Oh, yeah. um, this is this has been bubbling all day. Um, they call it bitter infighting. It basically, it, we found out today that Nigel Farage effectively sacked his deputy, Ben Habib. Farage is another new leadership team, making Richard Tice his deputy. Lee Anderson becomes chief whip, like you disagree with Lee Anderson. Millionaire donor, Sia Yusuf. I was worried. I thought it was Hamza Yusuf to begin with, chairman of the outfit. Ben Habib, that very strong tweet I've read already mm. saying he's considering his position. I have long-held concerns about the control of the party decision-making process. Let me read you some of this. Lindsay. Ben Habib is the only reason I voted for reform. He played a big part in where Richard and others are now. I am furious. Uh, Richard Tice, says Lisa, is not a patch. Richard Tice is not a patch on Ben Habib and never will be. Ben gives straight answers to questions. Tice was very evasive when you interviewed him. Typical politicians. Let's have a listen for you two. Uh, Richard Tice with me earlier. Have a listen. Ben's been a fantastic contributor to the party. There's lots of other important things that need doing. And, uh, I, you know, he's got a, a massive role to play going forward. So I'm only gutted that Ben didn't win in, Belling in uh, Wellingborough. He did really well for a great campaign, as did many, many others. But it's inevitably, when we're, I mean, having fought um, elections and lost them, you know, it's, it's gutting to lose. It's very exciting to win, but, but uh, you know, as you quite rightly say, uh, you know, Ben is a brilliant media performer, very strong on particular key issues like Northern Ireland, like the Constitution, like the ridiculous wokery and diversity, equality and inclusion. And no, look, I think it's, it's what we do is no different to the Tory party. The leader of the Tory party uh, decides who is the chairman and who is the deputy. And this is exactly the same. Yeah. So uh, that, that's the reality. And as I say, that's, uh, I think it's just the same uh, probably in the other parties. Um, let's start with you, Andy. Um, 
you're going to say this was bound to happen. I, I must say mm. I'm a little bit shocked. I did say to Richard Tice, there seem to be loads of deputy leaders. Um, our own David Bull is supposed to have been a deputy leader as well. I, I don't want to put this disrespectfully because I like Ben Habib and I agree with the people. I think he's been a complete asset and I think it's, I think it's a mistake. We're talking about... Farage is his figurehead saying it should just be the parliamentary party and yet we've heard loads over the last few days that they've swelled to 65,000 members. You've got to be very careful, haven't you, when you set something up and, and, and it seems that this is not playing out too well with people. You do, but ultimately the power lies and the, the influence lies really with the people who've been elected and Richard Tice won and Ben Habib didn't. It makes complete sense to have people in key roles within the parliamentary party. But what I would say is that Nigel Farage's track record is, a, as, is as an outstanding campaigner, nobody disagrees with that, but it's also as somebody who falls out with people time and time and time again. And there is no <clears throat> chance, bet you, there is no chance there will be five reform MPs at the end of this parliament. No David way. Bull, our colleague, has literally just tweeted this. I'm delighted to hand over the role of Deputy Leader of Reform to my friend and colleague Richard Tice, who will do an amazing job. I'm now going to concentrate on my media career whilst giving the party all the support I can. Can we try and get David on before seven o'clock? It's good to take. Benedict? I think, well, talking about how it needs to be about the parliamentary party, I wasn't aware that Zia Yusuf was a member of the parliamentary party. No, he's party. a donor. Yeah, that's what this is about. This is about somebody who's very suave, very savvy, very <laughs> media friendly and young. And being rich. promoted, and yeah, being promoted with his money uh, to a more influential position at the expense of somebody who is probably the most impressive intellectually of that group of people. Frankly, I think in he's terms probably uh, from the time I've interviewed mm. him, and I don't mean disrespect. One of the most intelligent, eloquent men I've yeah. I've ever spoken. to. I think that this is a mistake, and they've done this because they've got a shiny new toy, which is Mr. Yusuf. And I don't know Mr. Yusuf personally. I've only met Ben Habib on a handful of occasions, but I know what I've seen of all of them, and I know what other people say about them who do know them far more closely. Mr. Yusuf is somebody who is very impressive on the campaign are giving speeches and so they've decided to put him front and center he's young british muslim you know self-made sort of individual you can see why they'd want to do that alienating somebody like ben habib who you will need in terms of putting in place a party structure and a coherent ideology is a really stupid thing to do and i've said it before i don't think reform is going to be the party that takes over the right i know people are really keen for that to happen it's not going to happen because as has just been pointed out nigel farage also has a track record a of falling out with people he's also not the youngest person he's not going to be here in 10 years time with that wow factor if there isn't more of a party besides simply the nigel farage show then this party doesn't exist I disagree. I do think that there will be one more, at least one more, uh, reform MP. I think a certain Conservative is probably almost certainly going to end up defecting <laughs> to reform at some point, but we wait and see. As Are we to talking to finish our thing by a woman who yesterday was involved in mm. somewhat of a... Um, I mean, I, listen... I've <laughs> is said, it a very public nervous breakdown? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I've been very open about um, what I thought of the shambles of the Tory party mm. and why uh, reform have, have garnered the support they have. Massive spat yesterday, just quickly, from both of you on Twitter. Yeah. Mm. Braverman and Badenoch going head to head. Apparently, Badenoch went into uh, the shadow cabinet, ripped a second mm. backside out of Rishi Sunak, for want <laughs> yeah. of a better phrase. Uh, Braverman mm. was, was insulted. She took very badly to that. Um, I would say that Suella Braverman has cooked her goose, wouldn't you, gentlemen, in terms yes. of ever being able to lead the Tory party? 100%. Person. There's yeah. not, a, there's not a, a, a mainstream constituency for some things she's been saying. And she just comes across badly. That's the other thing. Yeah. She's not likeable. Simple as that. If she, if, you know, she, that people say that she speaks, uh, speaks for a certain wing of the party, but actually there are more competent MPs um, with equally large profiles who also do, and who have also been better at garnering support. I think it's very noticeable that lots of people are saying Priti Patel is very underpriced for the leader. She is on that exact same wing of the party. Nobody's talking about back backing Suella Braverman. Plenty of people are talking about backing Britain. I'll tell you the next leader. I think, leader Robert, I think Robert Jenrick no, is. You is both the man. missed out who the next leader will be, and everybody laughs at me. It'll be Tom Tugan out without any shadow of He's, I, I, I do I, think that I he'll think be in the, the I, do, Cameron -esque I think moment. the final two is Tugendhat and Priti Patel, given that there was a lot of talk about the two of them being yes. on the same ticket at one point. That's what I Might think. Might she happen. be the interim leader? I'm going to. Avoid. It's, it's curious because for a long time I didn't think she wanted to be the leader. I think that she understood actually that what would be required. Is that why we've heard not, nothing from her? Yeah, and I think that that's changed over time. I think that there was some suggestion that she would like obviously a big role and that she saw herself with a big role, but actually leadership was not the thing that she was aiming for, and that was why there was some talk of Tom Tugendhat. That. I don't think that that's going to Do you think that's sort of the mature, I've got experience in yeah. cabinet roles, I'm not saying that whilst all these young people are rushing around bitching and slagging mm. each other off is, is, is important? I think it is. And the other thing that has been kind of underreported is that the Conservative Parliamentary Party now is more centre right than right. 
it's actually a more... I think they lost the election. I think, I think, it, it, I think it has... I think if close. you look at the people who have stayed and the people who've been elected combined, I think it's a slightly more centrist party than it was... We've got ago. ten that's, seconds that's he's true. scowling at That's me. true, but if you select somebody like Priti Patel to be leader, she'll drag that party Absolutely to the right, sure. regardless of what the MPs You two are, are wonderful. To have done that with a hangover Benedict and an even worse <laughs> hangover Andy Williams, <laughs> we thank you very much, Steve. We'll have you on next week after the football. God, don't book them <laughs> on Monday. They won't be out of bed.